It's Monday, and I am angry. Again. It's time to get back on track and resume my weight loss plan, I said sarcastically to myself. I continued on. Because after a week of your version of debauchery, you won't reach your goals as planned. And as I continued on with the scolding, I felt more shame and then more anger. I thought I had this under control, I said to myself. I thought that after all of this time and knowing all that I know, that this next phase of my goal would be easier. I let out a sigh as the frown on my face grew and my energy continued to drop. I began to notice the switching pronouns as the conversation in my head went from my to you and your. The use of my weight loss plan was taking ownership of the plan, except was I really taking ownership of the entire plan? As in, was I taking ownership of the plan in terms of mindset, compassionate self-talk, and reflection and caring for my body in a loving way? And who was the other person in the conversation? Who was talking to me and telling me that if I didn't get my shiz in gear that I wouldn't reach my goals? Was that even me or was that someone else? I began to question with curiosity where I would have picked up that scolding from. I must have heard or read those same admonishing words a thousand times in a myriad of ways throughout the years. I recognize now that it was the same voice in my head that has been there for years who was always ready to chastise me again for what I had not yet accomplished. And I felt the same sense of shame and worthlessness as I did the first time I heard it when my school grades weren't perfect scores. This sense of perfection plagued me for years in nearly every area of my life. The tongue lashing I received was a very loud, domineering voice in my head, and it was a voice I both revered and feared. Yet it wasn't even my own voice, it just sounded like it. Once I learned that being perfect was the way to earn smiles, rewards, and love, there was simply no other way to be. Anything less than that wasn't good enough and I would be met with disdain and disapproval. This wasn't just about academics, it was about my weight too. Today I often wonder why a 12 year old girl would, would be on a diet and I am curious as to how the dieting concept found its way to me. Where did I hear that concept and where was it reinforced? I thought about it for a minute and then these ideas came to me. I attended a church with my parents and I remember all of the ladies talking about losing weight. Some joked about how things weren't going well and others promised to get back on track. No matter what they said, there was always a sense of disappointment with self on their faces as well as in their energy. They would all continue to strive to reach the state of thinness that would be acceptable to themselves and perhaps to others. The implication was that it would allow all of the other things to come into their lives that they truly wanted. At least that's what I understood as a young girl. My mom talked about losing weight for as long as I can remember. By her own definition, she was successful many times and then she would gain the weight back. There was a picture I remember so vividly of her with my sister. She would point it out and say, look how thin I was. I looked so good. There was always the follow up sentence of, I really need to lose weight followed by a long sigh and sense of disappointment once again. As a young girl, it seemed that the only acceptable outcome was to be thin and get back to a certain size or weight no matter what. 
I realize that I'm running the risk of putting this all on my mom, her friends, and other young women, but I am simply using it to illustrate how some of this became deeply ingrained within my psyche. The indoctrination of unworthiness, unbeknownst to them, and obviously began there unknowingly, and none of them could have known the impact of their own persistent discussions about weight. It wasn't just the lady sharing diet talk that impacted me, but this was at school too, where perhaps one is even more vulnerable to the social norms that are learned and established. Unbeknownst to my mother, I would peer over the shoulder of the gal in the bus seat in front of me who was looking at the strikingly beautiful models in the swimsuit and expensive clothes in the latest magazine. And while I don't recall anyone ever saying out loud that we needed to look like those models, we were each picking up on the subtle cues of how others responded to the photos with the Wow, she is beautiful. I'm sure we each thought, boy, wouldn't it be nice if others viewed me in the same way? Heck, even as adults, many of us in our 30s, 40s, and 50s are still having those same thoughts. Picking up on those subtle cues is how we begin to learn behaviors that allow us to be accepted and part of the tribe, if you will. Those subtle cues are picked up and translated by the brain, which are later converted into thoughts and take years to decipher. They can sound something like this. If I look like her, then others will like me and I will be accepted. If I am accepted, then I can be part of the group. And if I am not part of the group, then I will be alone. And being alone, and disliked will be painful. Of course, no one was consciously thinking of those thoughts. But on the level of the subconscious mind, being a part of a group means survival. We must remind ourselves that primarily the brain is concerned with survival, especially in those early years. So those thoughts did serve a purpose at the time. Let's go back to those thoughts for a second. If I look like her, then others will like me and I will be accepted. If I am accepted, then I can be part of the group. But if I am not part of the group, then I will be alone. And being alone and disliked will be painful. Stop and think about that for a moment. Might sound ridiculous now, but it wasn't exactly like that at 11, 12, or 13 years old. Let's ponder how the subconscious mind may protect us and help us when we are younger. At those ages, we haven't developed the ability to, to decide what we want to think and how we want to feel. So many of us embody what sounds good at the moment and what we mostly embody are things that don't ostracize us, although there are limits as we grow up, such as values, to that desire to be accepted. Not everyone responds in this way, as there are a few of those who cannot be separated from what they know is true no matter what. I certainly knew some gals like that. Maybe you did too. But I was not one of those. At least, not when it came to how I felt about myself. As I sit back and ponder all of those nuanced ideas, I can't help but ask myself, when do I get to live the life I deserve to live? When will it be my turn? Yet somehow the answer of right now never comes up. I was living in the mental prison of my thoughts and I used them to bribe myself with promises of rewards and love and punish myself if I wasn't compliant. If I didn't follow the plan exactly, my tongue lashing was lying in the wings. After all, I had already embraced the idea of not letting myself off the hook. 
Almost all coaches teach that, right? This isn't about who's right and who's wrong and which teaching philosophy you should embrace. This is about compassion. This is about being your own advocate. Seriously, with all of the tongue lashings, who is coming to your defense? If you aren't your own best friends, who will be? You and I both know that we have said things to ourselves that we would never say to a best friend. So why do we tolerate berating thoughts when we would never tolerate them from someone else. It's because our thoughts are mostly on autopilot and too often we don't even know that they are thoughts we consistently have, but we feel the energy slump as the shoulders drop. We feel the innate disappointment with self. We feel the judgment and the shame. Yet as an adult, if someone said those things to us out loud, we would react in defiance. Perhaps we would curse them out and then cry in silence. And then later we would find a way to never converse with that person again. I believe that we succumb to the internal voice because it's ours even if those thoughts were ones we picked up along the way. However much those thoughts seemed to derail your best efforts, they did serve a purpose at one time. At some point, you decided, whether you knew it or not, that it was best to embrace the thought, then reject it. At that time, all of the pros fell on the side of embrace this thought for your own survival. Your voice was always powerful. And when you were young, your subconscious made split second decisions to ensure that you would make it to the other side. Then as an adult, perhaps we never realized it was necessary to decide if those same decisions were serving us. You know, if you've ever attended a Tony Robbins event, then you know that you can make massive shifts in every area of your life when you make the decision to do so and it feels aligned. One exercise that I found to be so powerful that it literally made me shake was one which was part of the Dickens process called I Am The Voice. The event is centered around taking back control and becoming the dominant force and voice in your life. At that time, since I generally believed that I was powerless as a creator in my life, it's no surprise that this exercise was difficult for me. I still hadn't recognized many of the thoughts I had weren't mine. And when I tried to take control, perhaps a part of me still wasn't ready. Or perhaps it was the part that didn't believe I could take back control. I would cry and shake as I confidently tried to yell with authority, I am the voice. I will lead, not follow. Not only did this happen during the UPW event, but I would cry and shake as I tried the exercise once the event was over and I couldn't quite get the words out. I always felt this gigantic lump in my throat as I tried to squeeze the words out. I never quite understood why this would happen. I see now that I had not let my own voice of wisdom come forward. I was still a victim to the thoughts I had picked up along the way and they were louder than my own voice of knowing. You know, Dr. Dispenza talks about taking inventory of your thoughts in one of his courses. And I urge you to do this. I did this exercise in his course and I was shocked at the quantity of thoughts that I had that were persistent and had been there for many years. There may be thoughts that persist that perhaps you are not aware of. 
Consider the following. When your diet plan goes off the rails, what do you tell yourself? When you promised yourself you wouldn't eat sweets again, and then you did, what did you say afterwards? When you said you would start your new diet on Monday, and then you didn't, what did you say to yourself about why you didn't start Monday? When you realized you still couldn't get into that new pair of jeans or dress, what comments did you have about that? Every thought you've ever had about yourself started with someone else's idea about who you are and who you should be. Think of your loving best friend who is always compassionate. How does she feel about you? What would she say to you when things are not going the way that you had planned? And if you were your own best friend, would you condemn your efforts to create a healthy body? Or would you lovingly support and recognize every daily effort that you put forth? Well, it's my desire for you to be loving and compassionate to yourself. I also want the power for you to come forth. You don't need anyone to empower you. This is a gift that you give yourself. That empowerment begins with standing up with confidence and letting your subconscious know which direction you will be leading. And this is a good time to practice taking back control using I am the voice. You don't have to give credence to the voices and thoughts that were never yours to begin with. Right now is a good time to take inventory of your thoughts and begin the divorce proceedings of those thoughts you plan to leave behind. You'll recognize them as scoldings, the tongue lashings, the dominant voice that seems to imply that you're not good enough or that you can't do it or that you'll never get it right. Screw that. Your entire life is about inexperience. An experience that you create, an experience that allows you to grow and flourish as you were meant to. Visualize yourself cutting the strings to the mental prison of thoughts that are preventing you from leaping forward with your dreams and having what you want and being who you want to be. Unleash the vibrant rebel in sight and let her stand up tall and say, now I am the voice. I will lead, not follow. You don't have to wait until you lose weight to give yourself permission to step into who you are. You are already that. When you were born, there was a universal celebration because another soul would thrive and add to the expansion of the global collective. You are already worthy. You are already beautiful. You are already incredible. You are already becoming all that you need to be.